This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Tapp, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. We like a variety of topics on Money Talks. One week we'll have financial information for money novices. Another week we'll cater to sophisticated investors. Today we'll learn about multiples. What's that you say? Well, stay with us and you'll find out. Our expert hosts are always ready to take any of your personal finance questions. Uh, So good morning, Nancy. Let's uh, start with you. What financial news do you have in mind this week? Well, good morning. I'm thinking Christmas. You know, it's coming fast, not fast enough for all those children out there. (laughs) But connected to that, we're looking at retail numbers. We're expecting to have a really good retail season, which is being reflected in those higher prices, but also looking at the supply chain. And um, we're starting to see some relief. Our ports are not as backed up. Uh, Shipping rates are coming down. Certainly, they're not back to where they were before the pandemic, but we are seeing relief. But we were talking in the office about how that relief is not evenly distributed. And what we're seeing in bigger metropolitan areas, um, goods are starting to get through much easier. But if you're in a rural area, smaller town, um, you're having a a bit of a struggle. Uh, Larger retailers are managing this pretty well, but even they are struggling in these smaller areas uh, getting those goods. And certainly if you're a small retailer, it's a still a tough go. But this is going to take a while for it to ease, especially since we are all what I call Christmas crazy. (laughs) We are just so excited to finally be able to celebrate. And, you know, the earlier part of the season before Thanksgiving, I was out there buying my decorations, plenty of things on the shelf. But now it's just cleared out because we are just ready and anxious. And so that's contributing to those higher prices and the supply chain issues. Uh, I guess I'm lucky. The things I've been ordering, I really haven't noticed any delays. So I've been getting things uh, shipped on time. So I guess it might be part luck and part what you uh, buy. Um, And also I did all my... Go ahead. Maybe what maybe what you're buying, no one else knows. Kevin. <laughs> That's because I'm a unique individual. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, uh, good morning, Ryder. Uh, what's on your mind, financially speaking? Good morning, Kevin. I just want to verify first that when Nancy says that we are all Christmas crazy, she absolutely at least means herself. We were about a day and a half late getting the Christmas tree up in the office, and and boy, did we all hear about it. Um, but we have those decorations up now, so, so, so come on by and see the Christmas lights. So what has been interesting in the past few days, and, and this is something that cropped up over the past few weeks as well, is kind of the return of a little bit of volatility. And volatility, broadly, we often see it spiking when markets are going down, and and, and down quickly in particular. And volatility is just a measure of, a forward-looking measure of what investors through market instruments, so this isn't like a survey or anything, this is looking at market movements, what they expect the move, market moves to be in the future. And so the larger the market moves expected, the higher the volatility will be. So like I said, you often see it spiking when markets are going down, and for reference, Volatility index, the VIX we call it, is often hanging around in the kind of 14, 15, 16 range. It's just it's just a, a number. It's a dry number is all you get from it, and that's kind of a normal year. Not a lot going on, and and for a while we talked about it in a few years ago as wow, there's like no volatility, nothing's going on, the market's smoothly going up, everyone's happy. Well, last March, volatility spiked to just over 80 at the highest, which is super high, and came back down a good bit. So it's been in the 15 to 16 range, and last, um, at the end of the month, 
at the end of last month, beginning of this month, it was up to 30, and that was kind of a, a big, a big move up. Over the past few days, we have had a little bit of market move. I mean, the market is down maybe about one or two percent. S P 500 is down about two percent off its highs from a few days ago, and volatility is creeping up to about 22. It's around 21, 22 right now. So it's just kind of interesting to revisit that, see where it's going again. The expectation, even with the with the the couple of down days we've had in the market today and yesterday, it's it's not gone up super high. So so far, just tentative on volatility. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. There are different ways to learn financial theory, so we're lucky that uh, our host, Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, um, is a former associate professor of finance at Mississippi College, and she suggested our topic today. So, Nancy, what is the meaning of the phrase stock multiples? Well, a multiple is a way for us to compare pricing. You know, Kevin, when I go into the store, I'm going to look at that price tag. In fact, I'm going to look at that price tag first. And it registers in dollars and cents. So that's an easy way for me to compare one item to the other item. And as long as I'm looking at two items that I think are you know, identical as far as my needs, I'm going to look at the price. Um, if I go to another country that has a different currency, I'm really thrown off because I'm looking at a price tag that doesn't even register for me. Um, we get into trouble when we start to compare prices on prices per share when it comes to stock because that's not a good way to compare it. Instead, we need to use those multiples. Those multiples are like price tags that allow us to equate one stock to the other. For instance, if I look at Target and Walmart, similar industry. So Walmart is trading at about $143 a share. Target's trading at $234 a share. If I just looked at that dollars and cents per share, I would say, well, Target's more expensive than Walmart. But for a stock investor, you look at those multiples. I'm going to look at price as it compares to earnings, a P.E. multiple or P.E. ratio, price as it compares to sales, or price as it compares to their book value. And in this case, if I look at the price to earnings ratio, I find that Target is at 17 times, I always put that little X, times earnings. That's what it's trading at. And Walmart is at 50 times earnings. That price is 50 times their earnings, which means that Walmart is way more expensive than Target if I'm a stock investor. And I'm not going to get that by just looking at the price per share. So those multiples allow us to then really compare uh, within industries, across industries, different types of businesses to really see, is this a good value or not a good value? Is it an expensive stock or a cheap stock? Uh, Ryder, what feelings come over you when talking about the different ways to value stock? Uh, well, you know, I am very excited about this sort of conversation. I think it's very interesting to think about all the different ways to think about valuation. And again, multiples are a way of valuing those things, like Nancy said. And it's it's so interesting to think about what is appropriate what is an appropriate way to value different assets? What is an appropriate way to value different stocks, depending on what type of stock it is, how big is the stock, what does the stock do? But one way just to think about it is you, you, you are already going through your life valuing things differently. You value things, purchases like a car, differently from you value purchases like a house. And, and so you have different models for valuing those, and these multiples are just different models for valuing those. And I just wanted to add a little bit of color to what Nancy was saying about just knowing the price is not that useful. So I pulled up a few stocks. One is it's just having the raw number of price doesn't tell you if it's if it's cheap or expensive. There is a company called Seaboard Corporation, and I have not even looked too deep into what this does, but the price of the stock is almost $4,000 a share, uh, $3,833 a share. And so that is that's that's crazy. That's that's a really that's a that's a lot of 
dollars for that stock. And then you can compare that to a stock like the Baker Hughes Company, which is oil and gas services. They, they service rigs and things like that. And they trade at 24 almost $25. Well, which one is cheaper? Well, one of them you pay fewer dollars for. But on the other hand, if I told you that Baker Hughes is trading at almost 400 times earnings, so for every $400 you spend on Baker Hughes, you get $1 of earnings, whereas the Seaboard Corporation is trading at six times earnings. So for every $6 you put in it, you get a dollar of earnings. Well, now which one is cheaper? So having a multiple gives you a different an interesting way to compare those things. And that is just one of the multiples I know that we're going to talk about today. And, and, and like I said, there's going to be a lot of different ways to look at any given company and, and see what is appropriate, how, how is appropriate to compare them. If you have a question for our experts, send an email to money at mpbonline.org. It's not winter vacation. We're back in school to learn about stock multiples today. We know Nancy's a big fan of ticker symbols, so what is the New York Stock Exchange ticker symbol BID? Think about it during the break, and we'll have the answer for you next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Information presented on Money Talks is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult a financial advisor or any other qualified professional for guidance about your personal finance questions. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app and listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. On the New York Stock Exchange, the symbol BID. Nancy, what's your guess? Oh, it's an auction house. Southbase. Very good. You are. I, ahead. You, I cheated. Oh. <laughs> that makes sense, though. Bid auction house. That that that's uh, that'll work. Uh, we're going to be talking about multiples throughout the show. Ratios used to value stocks. But first, we do have a caller on the line. So why don't we invite Mike into the conversation? Calling in from Tupelo. Good morning, Mike. Go ahead. Good morning, guys. My question is about the uh, TIPS, uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Nancy mentioned them in the last month, and so I'm doing some research on them, and you can buy them direct from Treasury, or you can go through one of the mutual funds like Vanguard. I have some cash in an IRA, and I'm looking for a place to park it uh, and generate you know, a, a, a decent return with minimal risk. Does it make more sense to buy it from Treasury Direct or from one of the mutual fund companies where maybe there's a little more flexibility in coming out of it uh, rather than locking it in for 5, 10, or 30 years? 
Well, Mike, when you buy it from a mutual fund company, you're not buying one tip or one bond. You're buying a collection of tips or a collection of bonds. And the problem with that, yes, you have more flexibility. You can cash out any time. You don't have to wait till it matures. But then you're also subject to market risk because as interest rates change, then that can affect the price of the underlying bonds. Now, if you're buying tips, there's some built-in protection there, but still you are going to be exposed somewhat. Um, going through Treasury Direct means you're buying an individual Treasury bond with that inflation protection built in. So you do have to wait until it matures, but even if it fluctuates in the meantime, you don't really care. You're going to get your interest and you're going to get your money back. That's what you're after. So there's the difference. Now, I'm not sure, Ryder, do you know if Treasury Direct, Direct will allow you to do IRA accounts? So I'm not sure about that, but there is a slight difference, I believe, in what you would be purchasing um, on the market or from a mutual fund or ETF company versus from Treasury Direct. Treasury Direct, I believe you're referring to the Series I bonds. We've discussed those a number of times, I know, and and those are those are actually, if you want to get an investment which will match or ever so slightly beat inflation, Series I bonds are really the only way to kind of do that perfectly in that they earn two rates. They earn a fixed rate, which is fixed from the day that you buy it. That fixed rate is currently 0%. Surprise, surprise. And then they earn an adjust uh, an inflation adjustment, which is set every six months. So this past one was, I uh, want to say, 3.65% or something for six months, which gives an annualized 7.1, whatever, uh, for the year. And, and so that's what you get. And, and it's, it's kind of, when you buy it at Treasury Direct, you don't see a fluctuation in value. You, you just have an account. And like you were... Uh, said you, there are some lockups there. I believe it's five years. There's a penalty for early withdrawal. You can withdraw early, but there's a penalty for early withdrawal at Treasury Direct, and there's limits on how much you can buy. You can only buy 10000 a year per person. So while that's the best way to track slash beat inflation, whichever way you want to look at it, that that's not it, – it's, it's a little harder to access. With buying – TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, those are, just like other treasuries, those are publicly marketable things. You can go, if you have a brokerage account or you work with a broker, you can go buy act those actual bonds if you want. The one issue I have with buying those is you always have to know, again, we're talking about valuations today, so this is a great, great question. You have to know what the break-even rate is. So those naturally, when people are fearing high inflation, they will they will buy those, and the price of those on the open market where you would be buying it increases. So all of a sudden, it's not oh there's three percent inflation in the future, so therefore I get three percent on those. You get kind of the difference between what the tr inflation expectation at the time of purchase was and what inflation ends up being. I don't have the break-even rates in front of me right now, but I know recently they've been as high as three or so percent. So if you bought a bond, if you bought a TIPS bond, and inflation didn't average three percent, say, say it was less than three percent over the next five years, you would have been better off just buying a regular treasury. A regular treasury for five years is not earning a whole lot. If inflation was indeed over 3%, then it would have been better off to buy the Treasury Inflation Protected Security. But you wouldn't have gotten the full 3%. You would have just got the difference between, again, that rate that you purchased it at initially. And that's why the break-even rate is really important to look at when, and also over the entire term of the bond that you're expecting to hold it, if that makes sense. Yes, but you know, gosh, now it's even more complicated than I thought. So. Uh, oh yes, I'm sorry. I was not. I was not. I did not expect to simplify this question for you. <laughs> no. Whoops. My, my, my problem. My, my, my fault there. 
My brain, uh, essentially, my brain remembers what Nancy said that it was paying like seven plus percent, and that you could buy yes. ten thousand this year and say ten thousand mm-hmm. two, uh, yes. and and you know just as a as a way to hedge against inflation and a safe place to put some money. Yes, yeah, and that would be what you buy from Treasury Direct. It's it's got a lot of limits, but it's actually really good at providing you that inflation protect, protection. And so, if that's what you're looking for, if you're if you're looking for, I want what is essentially a savings account that is going to give me an inflation protected rate. That Treasury Direct Series I bond, that is what you're looking for. Um, Mike, let me also just give a plug here because one of the best hedges against inflation. Um, would be dividend paying stocks. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for your help today. Thanks for Good your luck. call. <clears throat> thanks for your call, Mike. We tried. This is. Uh, Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. We're talking today about multiples, the ratios used to value stocks. So, Nancy, after you calculate a company's financial ratio, what do you do then? Well, um, this is where it gets really uh, interesting to look at statistics. You know, we talk about employment rates, and we were talking about supply chain earlier, and we can look at it at the national level, but what's happening at the national level may not apply to what's happening to you in your little town. Well, it's the same kind of thing with these multiples. So we can look at the S&P 500, and that's the large group of big U.S. companies, and the average P.E. multiple is around 29 right now. That is applying to a wide array of, of companies. So you really need to make sure when you compare that, you're comparing it to similar companies that do similar types of businesses that are in the same types of industry. And you, as you start to drill down, you will then see some um, uh, commonalities there, and you will start to see that uh, those P.E. ratios, those other multiples, should be similar if they're within the same type of business. And that allows you to compare one to the other. You certainly cannot compare a um, General Motors to a Walmart. It's two totally different types of businesses. So, Ryder, what's the difference between enterprise value multiples and equity multiples? Yes, so there are a lot of terms out here and, and, and a lot of multiples that we're going to talk about. And they, they're all kind of measuring the well, similar things in different ways. So if we're thinking about all of these as price multiples, then you are just saying, what is the, what is the price of this stock versus some unit, some measure of value, be it earnings, be it cash flow, be it hard assets that they have, be it enterprise value. And so what is enterprise value? Enterprise value is the market capitalization of the company, so the value of all the shares out there today. If you were to just go buy the whole thing, how many dollars would you have to put out there? And then adds the debt on top of that. So if a company has debt, if you were buying the entire company, you would not only have to pay for all of those shares, you would also have to be you would be responsible for all of the debt. So you need to add that in. And then it's minus the cash because again, if you if you bought the company you could you could back the cash out and use that to, to, to pay other things. So this isn't all. This is not always used with price. It's often used with some sort of earnings measurement to say, oh, how fast can this company pay itself back? Because people are looking at this as as, as purchasing the entire company at a time. So it's appropriate for say large institutions and private equity buyers. It gives a larger ratio if you have more debt. So you're, you're having to spend more dollars per unit of value if, you're, if, if it's got more debt. And if there's more cash, then it gives a lower ratio because there's, there's fewer units of value um, per, per unit of enterprise value. So it's appropriate for some investors, like I said, those purchasing an entire company, that would, that would make sense. Equity multiples, probably talking about book value here. So that is all the assets of a company minus all the liabilities of a company, what's left, 
and then apply a price multiple to that. One really easy way to think about this is think about your house. Say you purchased a house, it was $100,000, you have a mortgage on there, it is uh, $70,000, you owe $70,000. The equity in your house, we often talk about home equity, is $30,000. So that's, that's just the assets minus the liabilities. For a company, this might be their assets could be they've got a factory and they owe some debt on that factory. Well, they also have they also have brands, they have inventory, they have cash in the bank, but then again, they also owe people. They owe their workers, their payroll, they owe their suppliers payment for the supplies they bought. So, those all go into calculating that book value, which again, is assets minus liabilities. And this can be really useful. This is really useful for folks who are buying just a small amount of the company. Say you're buying a single share. You want to say, well, I get a little slice of kind of what's left over after you subtract the li liabilities from the assets. So that's how I want to look at that. Again, all these multiples are, are very useful for different reasons. They all tell you valuable information, and and you should definitely look at more than one because there's – there's a lot of them out there. Today we're talking about valuing stocks, but we're also looking for your general personal finance questions. Can you guess what the NASDAQ stock symbol is for Dave & Buster's Entertainment? We'll have that for you next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is Money Talks, MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. Dave & Buster's Entertainment uh, is a restaurant on arcade chain. Their NASDAQ stock symbol is play. Uh, so, Nancy, I think we've mentioned this before, but the company is allowed to pick uh, whatever symbols they want, provided nothing's been used before. Is that right? Yeah, it's sort of like when I put in my user ID for a new website and I plug something in and it pops up, not available. Um, they have to do the same thing. So they get to choose, and they want to choose something that is similar to their name that people will remember, but it has to be something that has not already been used. So there's some real fun ones out there. Cake, C-A-K-E is Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> um, how about Buns, B-U-N-Z, that is Schlotsky's Deli. Yes. And uh, Bud, B-U-D, what, what do you think that is? Budweiser? Yes, Anheuser-Busch, <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, now, we have some old symbols that have been around for a while that are, you know, one or two letters. There's famous one letter uh, T is AT&T. Uh, General Motors is GM. Uh, most companies now and even exchange-traded funds have three or four letters. So uh, IBM is IBM. Uh, Microsoft is MSFT. If you own a mutual fund, what I call an open-end mutual fund, it's going to have five letters, and the last letter will always be an X. One other fun one is EAT, e -A -T, which is Brinker International, that is a big restaurant chain that owns Chili's. Hmm. So Apple could be G-R-A-N-N-Y-S-M-I-T-H. Yeah. <laughs> 
No. <laughs> That'd be a little much. That is it way is too long, Kevin. Imagine having to type that in every time. <laughs> All right, we've got a caller on the line. Why don't we say good morning to John in Hattiesburg. Hello, John. You're on the air with us. Thank you for taking the call. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, my wife and I are both retired. We're not needing to use our retirement fund right now. Uh, and I'm wondering, are, are we able and would it be a good idea to, for our donations next year to take it out of our retirement fund to reduce our future RMDs? How old are you, John? Yes, I think that's a great idea. Uh, as long as you are 70 and a half, you can send your send money directly from your IRA to a charity, and, and you need the custodian to make the check out to the charity. So charities, churches, and, and schools are generally all, all qualified. And it's important that the custodian sends it directly to them or made out to them instead of sending it to you, and they can send it to you made out to them, but as, as long as it's not passing through your hands. And that is the only way you can make sure that it is, does not count as income for you. Otherwise, you're just withdrawing money from your IRA and then, and, and, and then making a donation. If you're doing significant donations, it might not make a big difference for your tax situation. But for many folks, it does make sense, and it, and it will work out best for them to send it directly. And again, that is if you are over 70 and a half, which is the old required minimum distribution age, that is still available to you uh, up to a limit of $100,000 per person. Okay, I turned seventy. I turned seventy in March. Does that count? You turned seventy in March. I will turn. No, this coming in oh, you March will of twenty-two. Turn. I'll turn seventy. Then you can do it in twenty-two, because you will turn seventy and a half in next year. Yeah, and that's what I was looking at trying to do it next year. Do I have to wait till I yep. turn seventy and a half before I make the donations, or I can do it at any time during the year? I, I don't believe the timing during the year matters. I believe it is the year that you turn that age that matters. Okay. And, John, it's typical on this that every time you make a donation, uh, a donation to a separate entity, a separate charity, your church, uh, whatever, that you fill out a separate form with your institution. But check with your institution on how to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you for taking this call. That's been very helpful. Multiples are ways of valuing stocks, so we're going to make up a company and call it Kevin's Sneakers. That sounds pretty nice. Uh, so, Nancy, what do we want to know about Kevin's Sneakers as a company to evaluate its stock price? Well, if you're going to buy into a company, and buying a share of stock is exactly that, you're becoming an owner of the company, then you're looking at, well, is this company going to be profitable? Because that's how I'm going to get my money back and more than that through the years. So you need to start with, well, what are they selling? Um, how long have they been around? Um, are their expenses less than, the, than what their, their revenue is, their sales are? Are they making money? Um, are they managed well? Do they have a lot of debt on their books? So you start to really look at financial statements because that tells you the story of the business. And that's why it's really important if you're a stock investor to, to understand about accounting, financial statements, so you can start to dig in. And not just look at it at one point in time, but over a period of years. How are they doing? Um, are their earnings increasing? Are they managed well? Is their debt declining versus is it going through the roof? And that's a sure red flag. So all those things that you look at to say, is this a good company? Is it growing? Is it producing positive earnings? That's what you want to know before you invest and put your money down. And so uh, what ratios can we calculate? Well, if you look at those financial statements, you can calculate all the ones we've been talking about, a price to earnings, those multiples, those ratios. Um, you can also look at debt ratios. Those are very important things to look at to see, have they taken on too much debt? Are they going to drown in it? Or is this a reasonable amount to allow them to grow? So there's a full set of financial ratios that we teach uh, on a college level. We're talking about finance. And you can look at every single one of those that really 
really address different parts of the business to figure out if this is something you want to participate in. So, Ryder, if we were to compare Kevin's sneakers ratios to other companies, what exactly are you looking for? And I guess it might depend on what ratio we're talking about. Yes, what ratio? And really importantly, I, I, I want to I want to get back to what Nancy said. You got you have to know a lot about the company. You know, is, is it a new company? Is it an old company? Is is it ha, does it have a lot of debt? Is it growing quickly? Is it growing slowly? But I want to get back to this Kevin sneakers. What exactly does Kevin sneakers do? Does it does it sell sneakers? Does it make revenue and hopefully profit from selling sneakers, or is it simply buying sneakers for your personal? collection <laughs> because those are dramatically different companies and 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 we can realistically value either one it's going to be a lot easier to value it if it just buys sneakers for your collection because you would just say you would take something like you would look at the the fundamental ratios of of, of book value so what is the value of all the assets minus the liabilities of the company and then what is the price divided by that book value? Because that would tell you, okay, he's got $100, every $100 worth of sneakers is being sold for $90. Well, that's a good deal I, because I can't just go to the store and get 100 I mean, unless I have a, well, I guess if I have a discount card or a coupon, I could, but I'm not really sure how that works. But then again, if you looked at it and you said, okay, Kevin's got a collection of sneakers and it's a really nice collection and he's selling shares and you get effectively a hundred dollars worth of sneakers but you have to pay a hundred and thirty dollars for it well I'd have to really expect the value of those sneakers to just go through the roof really quickly for it to be worthwhile to buy that and so that's because that's a, a company that it, it's not generating revenue on its own it is simply a value of this this of their fixed assets and, and so so if you're comparing it to other companies, which are just most most of their value is in their assets, you want to use the, that sort of ratio, the book value ratios, like we discussed before, the equity ratios, maybe if it has some sort of profit generating on top of that, you might want to use that enterprise value ratio to some sort of earnings. That's one way to do it. If it is selling sneakers, then you want to go back and say, okay, well, does it is it comparable in various qualities to the other companies that we're looking at? So are all of the companies maybe the same age? Are they at this at similar growth phases? If Kevin Sneakers is very new and it's growing fast and it's opening up new stores, it's probably probably what you'll see and what you'll care about most is looking at the the revenue, just to say is it is it actually big enough? Are are people actually paying attention and buying products from this because it might not have earnings. It's really expensive to start up a sneaker store and you, you might be spending a lot of money. So even though you have a lot of revenue to show, you might not have a ton of earnings. So we might want to concentrate on the revenue if you're growing fast. If, if you're a more stable company and you're comparing it to more stable companies, you're just generating good revenue, you're, you're trying to run your business well, then you have earnings to compare to. So you can compare your price to earnings ratio with other similar companies. Again, you're, with those sort of ratios, you're looking at companies that are in similar phases of their life. And, and of course, you just have to think, does this company have earnings? Is it going to have it in the future? And then, like Nancy said, you want to look is is are the debt numbers comparable are the re revenue earnings cash flow those are going to be things that you compare within companies at a similar stage in their life so i know we've invented this company for our discussion purposes but it, is there real, a real company out there where people are investing in in someone else's collection it's possible uh, so there are essentially funds like a closed-end fund that purchases gold or something. People are buying – that is technically a company, and people are buying shares of that fund, 
or that company, which is just just tracks gold. I, I mean, really, any fund is just a collection of things. Now, I don't believe there are any funds that just track a bunch of sneakers, but there are funds that track just collections of things. There are funds that just buy real estate. There are funds that just buy gold and silver. There are funds that just buy stocks. There are funds that buy bonds. There are funds that buy treasury infl- treasury inflation protected securities, like we were just talking with John, uh, uh, sorry, with, with Mike just a minute ago. And so those are all funds, and you can go out and you can look at the value, much like if you had a fund of sneakers, and you could say, okay, well, I'm just going to add up the value of all these sneakers, because you can get, you know, check on, on sneaker resale websites to see the price of them. You can add up the value and say, okay, well, this fund is currently trading for $90, but it's got $106 worth of sneakers per share. You can do the same thing for a fund which is just holding gold or real estate or stocks. Many of them trade very close to that true value, but some of them do fluctuate for various reasons. Well, understand too, Kevin, that there are a lot of companies that put their shares out there and investors buy them based on hype, speculation, and so they're buying something that doesn't have earnings, maybe doesn't even have a structure. Um, the latest one is the special interest group, uh, the special purpose group, the SPAC, that is Trump's media company. And that company is not really even up and going. It doesn't have financial statements. It has nothing. And yet it's being valued at these enormous numbers. Um, so that happens all the time. We saw plenty of that at the end of the 90s, where all of these dot coms just, they created a business, they got people to buy shares. But there was really nothing there. You were buying a bill of goods. Kevin, what I'm hearing from Nancy is that now is the time to launch your sneaker (laughs) collection fund. What I'm hearing is the market is begging for a product like this, and you can go out there, raise a bunch of money, buy a bunch of sneakers, and people will trade it on the stock exchange. Kevin, um, what's going to be the ticker of your sneaker company? Uh, that's a good one. Let me think. Um, <clears throat> oh, gosh. Nancy, you're good at this. What would be a suggestion? <laughs> Shoe? S-H-O-E? How, well, Shoe is good. good. Let's see if that about, one's taken. Um, S-N-E-E-K. Ah. Shoe is not that. taken. Surprise. Yeah, E to, from an A to an E because you're being a little sneaky here. All right. <laughs> we'll go with that. S N E E K for Kevin's sneakers on the uh, out there if you're if you're looking for it. So, we're learning about multiples to value company stock today. What would be a good symbol for an oil and gas company? We'll have two suggestions next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. We're glad you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lodridge anderson president of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspective. 
new perspectives. Uh, here is a program reminder. Tuesdays at 10 a.m., listen live to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio immediately following Money Talks. Direction Daily S&P Oil and Gas EXP has two different stocks, one with the symbol DRIP and the other with the symbol GUSH. So that's a good one for oil and gas. And you're right, Nancy, there are quite a bit. That would be a fun thing to do on, on a, I don't know, lazy afternoon if you're looking for some diversion is to see all the interesting symbols uh, and the, uh, the the puns in, uh, contained therein, I'm sure. Yes, Bond, one's out I've, there. I've got two more in the, in the oil and gas area because that one's interesting because those are funds which just track, I uh, believe those are either tracking, those are tracking baskets of stocks and, and one is basically betting on them going up. That's the gush because you want you want a gusher in oil. And the other one is tracking is is doing the inverse. So if they go down, you're making money. So that's drip. If there's only a drip of oil, you're not making much money. But in the oil field, I feel like the oil and gas companies are kind of a fun loving bunch sometimes. There are two really good ones that I like. One is rig, which is Transocean. Mm -hmm. They own and they lease out deep water drilling platforms. Of course, we know from the kind of the deep water horizon uh, incident was, I believe, a transocean rig. So they rent out rigs, and so their name is Rig. So that, that works out nicely for them. And then another one called Diamondback. They're in exploration and production, so they're going out there, uh, mostly in Texas, I believe, and, and drilling holes and pulling up, pulling up oil. And they're Diamondback, uh, like a Diamondback rattlesnake, and their symbol is Fang, F-A-N-G. <laughs> so that kind of goes along with the, the playful nature of their name. This is sort of a tangent, but uh, but uh, Ryder mentioned the the company that built the rig that was connected to the Deepwater Horizon um, issue. What was I think 2010, if I remember correctly. How long does bad press like that usually take for a company to kind of clear that and 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 put that in their review mirror? Uh, well, that's, that's a it. good question. So, what ultimately? What's driving the stock price is the company's ability to continue to make money. And so Transocean, they rent out deep water drilling platforms. They depend on companies needing to rent out deep water drilling platforms, which depends on the price of oil being high enough that it's worth it for them to go out to all that trouble and expense out in the middle of the ocean. It's not the middle of the ocean, but very far out to get that oil. So they depend on high oil prices really more than anything. That being said, if an incident like that, you they do bear some responsibility there. All, all the there are several different companies involved. Obviously, there was BP was the major, uh, the oil major on, on that. They rented out the the rig itself. There were other companies involved, and, and so. If someone looks at that company and it, and it hurts their reputation so much that nobody wants to do business with them, then that's a serious problem for them. For that type of area, there are not a lot. There are, I want to say, two major companies that rent out rigs like that. I mean, there's a number of companies that own rigs and can rent out those rigs, but there's two major companies focused on, the, on that lease and rental area. So it's not like people had a lot of choice, even if they were a little iffy on Transocean. They may be the only shop offering you a rig, so you have to you have to rent it from them anyway. So that could be that could be one way that it affects their stock price. Uh, we're a little bit pressed for time, and I think this is a question that we can answer quickly. But someone called in and was wondering if the minimum age for the RMD required minimum distributions was went up from seventy one and a half to seventy two. Nancy, do you know? It it is at seventy two, but then uh, Ryder referenced this seventy and a half because we have this change in the law with using your required minimum distributions for charitable donations. And so we're taking advantage of when you hit 70 and a half, but it is 72 when you have to start taking those out. All right. Very good. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by generous financial support from listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org. 
or listen to the podcast by searching for Money Talks on your preferred podcasting app. Our show is produced by Liz Gill, and our call screener today was Java Chapman. So for Dr. Nancy Lotter janderson and Ryder Taff, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for Money Talks, heard only on MPB Think Radio.